My guest tonight is a retired four-star general, former director of the CIA and NSA, and author whose latest book is called The Assault on Intelligence, American National Securities in an Age of Lies. Please welcome Michael Hayden. <laughs> Welcome back to the show. Thank you. It's good to have you here. The last time I saw you, uh, we were debating the possibilities of Trump having a presidency and what that presidency could look like if uh, it carried on. I, I, I recall the conversation. It has now come to pass. <laughs> um, and your book, your book is speaking directly to the situation we're right. now, the assault on intelligence. You make your point throughout the book about how Trump's lies have wrecked havoc on the intelligence community. What does that mean? So, so let, let me kind of structure it as, as how I, I approach it in the book. It's kind of a three-layer problem, and, and it's really important to understand the layers, all right? Layer one is us, all right? It's our political culture, which has moved into what the Oxford Dictionary calls a, a post-truth world, right. in which we make decisions based upon emotion, preference, allegiance, tribe, grievance, not on facts, right. not on data. Donald Trump... We were here two years ago talking about this. Donald Trump recognized that. He saw it. He exploited it during the campaign, and I think he has worsened it with some of his behavior and language while he is president. He's right. riding that post-truth wave. And then, finally, to make this really complicated, we've got a foreign adversary kind of coming through the perimeter wire on us, recognizing what's going on here and exploiting it. Right. And it's all based, Trevor, on the concept of truth or post-truth. How, how is it that it benefits Trump and nobody <clears throat> else? I mean, shouldn't something uh, like living in a post-truth world also yeah. damage Donald Trump as the person in power? Well, um, it will over time because history has shown, and I, I actually, I hope people enjoy reading the book, but I really enjoyed writing and researching it. I got out, out of my circle and talked to a lot of folks right. that I would not normally have talked to, philosophers, historians, and so on. And what they point out, that the approach the president is taking, this kind of post-truthism, which we've seen elsewhere, it doesn't deliver. I mean, you've got to base decisions on reality, right. based on facts. So over time, I think we'll recognize we're, down, we're speeding down a cul-de-sac here. Right. But it's going to take time. Now, why do you say that it wrecks havoc on the intelligence community yeah. specifically? Because I understand democracy, I understand the American right. people being affected by this, but why does the intelligence community get affected? Surely they are, they're immune to this. No, um, not really. And it, let, let me try to describe it this way. The high friction points of the administration with the broader society have been with intelligence, uh -huh. law enforcement, the courts, journalism, Science, right. scholarship, what do they all have in common? They're all fact-based. They're all evidence-based enterprises. Right. And that's where we see the, the friction with, with a style of governance that, that is post-fact, not based on, on hard reality. Right. So we're, it's really interesting. I kind of counted them off on my fingers. Uh, last time we were here, all right, the intel digit was over here. Right, right, right. Because these folks over here had serious questions about how we acquired data. Right. You and I have had that conversation. Uh, that's not the argument today. These folks over here welcome the intel guys into this circle now because we'll get back to arguing about how we acquired it later. Right. But right now they recognize us, like them, as data people. Uh -huh. And it's, it's the fact-based enterprises that feel under siege. Do you understand, though, why some people would argue that Donald Trump is well within his rights to... Uh, attack the, the intelligence communities because in some ways the intelligence communities have been responsible for misinformation themselves. I mean, one of the classic examples was the flawed intelligence report that led America to the war in, in Iraq. So right. if somebody says, yeah, but Donald Trump is saying these fake things, some might argue, yeah, but the CIA and the NSA and the, all these organizations also did that and that's why America's in Iraq now. A great question. And you and I kind of worked our way through that issue. And I, I mentioned the last time I was here, I was in the room. I voted for it. I believed it to be true. We were wrong. But, but the difference is we were trying to pursue an accurate picture of objective reality. Right. We, we got it wrong, all right? I mean, life's hard. And, and sometimes, even with your best effort, fact-based institutions fail to get the true picture. Right. That's not what we're arguing about today. What we're arguing about is decision-making that is indifferent to objective reality, that is based on these other things, preference, grievance, tribal loyalty. 
It's interesting that you say preference and tribal loyalty specifically because um, this week <coughs> Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin yeah. Netanyahu um, delivered a presentation where he spoke about uh, the proof that Iran had lied about their nuclear weapons program. Now, there seems to be conflicting schools of thought on this. Some say Iran hasn't lied. This was old information that Netanyahu tried to present as new. Others are saying, no, there, there, there was something new. Is there something new in this, discovering yeah. that Iran kept the, the, the information, the archives on how to make nuclear weapons? So, so I think, and beyond think, I know, this was baked in already to our nuclear negotiations. Uh, I walked into President Bush and Vice President Cheney late 07 and said, I know you're not going to welcome this message, but the Iranians appear about four years ago to have stopped building the bomb. Right. They're doing the other stuff, the missiles, the centrifuges, but the building the bomb, we think they stopped. And, and Mr. President, this isn't absence of evidence. We've got evidence of absence. Right. We know, we know that, they've, that they've stopped. Now, number one, Iran never admitted that they were building a bomb up until 2003. Uh -huh. They denied it. They lied. We knew that. What you've got from the prime minister is a lot of the fine print with regard to where the Iranians were. But the fact that they were building a bomb and that they lied about it, already accepted, already known, and as I said, already baked in to our approach. So it's interesting that he came out and presented all of this information the way he did. You know, it was a big PowerPoint presentation. Iran <clears throat> lied, and he had all these CDs, and it was very, very uh, dramatic. I mean, he revealed everything, very theatrical as well. It almost felt like he wasn't playing to the intelligence community and other leaders. It seemed like it was an audience of one that he was playing to, someone yeah, who I... likes big pictures and easy words to understand. <laughs> <laughs> Could it be that Netanyahu will now be the reason Donald Trump decides to definitively pull out of the Iran deal? And you know, he has to make that decision again in 12 days. Right. This is not happening uh, by accident. So, so I do think there may have been some theatrics there, given the president some additional motivation, right. additional top cover, perhaps, if the president really does want to rip up the deal. But a lot of folks like me, including the people in my old jobs in this government, mm -hmm have pointed out that, no, no, we knew this. This is old data. So here's a case where the fact-based guys, the intelligence community in this right. case, journalism, they're holding their ground. And they're saying, we like to have the fine print. That's really useful. But in terms of the broad plot, no, we knew this. Let's talk about one additional thing that you lay out in the book. As you said, the, the, the structuring the book into thirds, the third of Russia. Yeah. Russia and <clears throat> the bots and Facebook has become a story that has been all over the news. Many have labeled this as one of the biggest threats to America's democracy yeah. because they're, they're pushing forward the post-truth world. Some might say Russia is only doing to America what America has been doing to them. How do you respond to this as somebody who knows better than anybody right. what America did yeah. to influence or not Russia's elections? Other than an, as an element of American policy to support what you and I would call democracy, there, there are no comparisons between what we do and what the Russians have done to, to our election. Remember my, my three-layer cake here? Right. And the biggest problem is us. Um, that enables the Russians to mess with our heads. Uh -huh. I mean, they've actually made a run at the Norwegians, too. It didn't work because Norway isn't a fractured society. And so what the Russians are doing is using high technology, right. an approach to information dominance, which I, I have to tell you, Trevor, in, in terms of its elegance as military doctrine, is really quite good. And if you read the Russian manuals about this, it's quite revealing of some really serious thought. They call it contactless war, where we can use informational means right. to affect the target population of our adversary. But they're only able to do that because of our own weaknesses. Look, uh, cards face up. I mean, I'll be the last one to say that our government hasn't ever conducted a covert influence campaign. Right. All right? But there's an iron law of physics with regard to covert influence. All right? You never create fractures. The only way you can make covert influence work is to identify pre-existing fractures, and then worsen them and exploit them. That's what the Russians are doing. Wow. It's a fascinating book. Uh, you get into it in depth, and it is terrifying and also enlightening at the same time. Thank you so much for Thank being you. on the show. Great having you back. The Assault on Intelligence is available now. Michael Hayden, everybody.